Hello friends and family and welcome to the Saturday, August 1st edition of the Crippling Anxiety Meditation Conversation. We touched on the topic of guilt briefly with respect to the idea of feeling guilty about getting exercise or not getting exercise. And I wanted to delve into that topic a little more partly because I've been feeling some guilt lately uh, about the things that we feel we should be doing. And this is a bit metaphysical almost. The, the idea of our consciousness craving for a thing that we feel we should accomplish. It's not that we're necessarily craving for the accomplishment itself, the goal. Um, there is a lot of literature and psychology that goes into this idea that if we chase after something and then we achieve that thing, that we find ourselves unsatisfied that once we've achieved it, oh, we made a million dollars. Well, now how to make the next million, how to make 10 million. We all are familiar with this idea um, and the science behind it, the, the science of psychology. But there's a less observable phenomenon that I think we're all familiar with, which is this craving to do something. It's not necessarily a craving for the end result. It is a craving to act. And in times like this, it's not always possible to act, not only because it's very difficult to go outside and to engage and to attend a meeting, but also because the network of constraints surrounding us is limiting in ways that are structural, no doubt, but maybe invisible to us. And so I find myself personally feeling guilty that I'm not doing the work, not that I'm not getting to the result, but that I'm not doing the work or I'm not doing the work fast enough. I'm not doing the work in the way I wish I would. And that feeling, I think, is exacerbated by the circumstance of quarantine or the circumstance of partial lockdown or full lockdown, where we intuitively and it's not an unreasonable intuition, feel as though we should be able to accomplish more. And as it turns out, we often do not, <laughs> or at least I'm certainly finding I'm not. And I think that this is an extension of the way that we grow up to some extent. So I remember as a child, Particularly, if I, if I think about some of my most vivid childhood years, when I was 10 years old, 11 years old, 12 years old, and there was this sense that there was something just around the corner, that soon I'll be going into junior high, and then I'll be going into high school, and then once I finish high school, I can go to university. There's a feeling, an anticipatory feeling, which leaves a person as a child um, accepting whatever is going on, even if it feels incredibly boring. Oh, okay, I have to do this chemistry assignment. It's very boring, but I have to do it. This is my job. This is my task. And I'll slog through this chemistry assignment, and on the other side will be basketball or a bit of TV or whatever it is. Um, in my case, it was computer programming actually some of the time as, as a early teenager. Um, 
But there was always the bigger idea that after that, I got to go to university. I got to become something. I got to explore the world. And as an adult, we don't really have this feeling anymore. We get here, we get to university and we're kind of like, well, yeah, okay, university, is, it's fun. And we explore and we maybe party too much or we work too hard, whatever we do. And then we get into the complete adult world. We start to influence the totality of our environment. So now we can go out and we can become a significant person in a significant company or a significant government. And we can influence other human beings and the lives of other human beings. And once we feel like we are there, that's the state we're in. Um, and it need not be the most significant. It need not be the most significant company or the most significant government that we're participating in. It could be local government. It could be, um, it could be a hospital, a local hospital. But now we're participating in the real thing. This is it. We've arrived. And once we have that feeling that here and now, this is it, there is often a feeling which accompanies that, which is that now I, now I need to do more. Now I need to do more. I need to help more patients if I'm in a hospital. I need to speak to more students if I'm in a school. It, I need to do my work more effectively, more efficiently, more purposefully. If I'm saving money, I need to save more money. I need to be more effective with my savings. If I'm teaching someone else something, I need to teach them in the best way possible. My output needs to be higher. My returns need to be higher. My participation needs to be more. And this feeling of agency can be quite liberating in a lot of cases. I think that um, for many people, high school in particular can be a very unpleasant experience. Um, and that university and work life are freeing in some way. But this feeling that here and now, this place, this routine, this job, this life that I'm living, this is real life, makes us feel a bit anxious and often, in my case, a bit guilty. And these feelings kind of bundle together that I need to be doing more and therefore I should feel guilty about the fact that I'm not doing more. And it's unproductive, obviously. We can rationalize our way through this and see, well, okay, feeling guilty doesn't help me achieve more. It just make me, makes me feel bad and add a bit or a lot of depression to whatever anxiety I'm feeling. But it is a tempting way to feel and it's a sort of an intuitive way to feel. And when we are trapped at home, this feeling can really bear down on us because all there is is the work that we should be doing. We should be vacuuming. We should be mopping. We should be doing the dishes. We should be cooking a meal. We should be doing extra work. We should be learning a new language. We should be doing so many things. And it would be wrong to say that it's not valuable to take advantage of the position that we're in if you are trapped at home and the best you can do is to enhance yourself in some way if you want to learn a new skill, if you want to learn a new language, that's good. But for us to feel bad that we're not doing those things is not good. And again, we can reason our way through all of this. 
we can see intellectually that what I'm saying here is not profound. Um, we all understand it. But the problem in all of these sorts of situations tends to be that we can see clearly how to think rationally about the fundamental problem at hand. So I'm feeling some guilt. Rationally, I know that this is a, an irrational way to feel. Why am I feeling guilt then? Um, because we're not rational beings, right? Human beings are composite. We are these sort of walking, thinking meat blobs. And we only have so many tools at our disposal. Rationality may help a little bit. It can help on the surface, but it can't fundamentally alter the way that our brain chemistry works. It can't fundamentally alter the way our habits have formed. And when I say habits, I mean habits in the sense of habit pattern, uh, habits of thinking, not necessarily the habits. Our behavioral habits can be changed through rationality. We can, we can read a book like Atomic Habits and we can be better at habits, right? External habits. But our internal habits, the way that we think, the way that we feel, this requires a bit more internal operation. And this is where Anapan can be a valuable tool. It essentially provides us with a window into bare truth. It gives you a way to see bare truth. Oh, okay, the breath is coming in and it's coming in and now it's stopped and now it goes out and it goes out and it goes out. There's nothing to rationalize there and there's nothing to really um, intellectually deconstruct and this is to our advantage. So if I'm feeling guilty because I haven't put out the YouTube video in time for my family and, and friends, um, I can think about that, but the thinking will only cause more anxiety. It will only cause more guilt or it will undercut the guilt. It will move the guilt around, but it doesn't, it doesn't really change the nature of the origin of guilt. And it's a bit difficult to explain why meditation does this, but it is, it is a partner of rationality, let's say. So I have the capacity to rationally approach a feeling like guilt. Okay, guilt, it's not healthy. It's not productive. I shouldn't feel that way. Now what? All forms of rationality are valuable and can be augmented by other tools. And meditation in particular, anapan and vipassana, give us a tool for embedding that rationality. So not only am I able to think in the abstract about these ideas that I want to rationalize, I want to capture, and I want to come to the right conclusions, conclusions based on facts, conclusions based on science. Um, I don't want to come up with some hokey mythology or cosmological reasoning for how my biology works or how the university, university, how the universe works. Um, I want to come to rational conclusions and I want to know that those rational conclusions are meaningful. 
that they are correct, insofar as I'm able to ascertain that they are correct. And once I've done that, anapan and vipassana are a way to apply them. So the things that you know to be true in your life, they may not necessarily be aspects of rationality. You may feel certain things about metaphysics. You may feel certain things about science. You may feel certain things about the cosmology of the universe. You may. If you know those things to be true, you will find them to be even more true in meditation because they will align with the actual truth. The actual truth is all there is to explore in meditation. Okay, the breath is coming in, the breath is going out. My mind wandered away. That's also the truth. Okay, bring it back. Breath is coming in, breath is going out. There's some sensation there. My cold or itching or dryness or whatever. These truths need not be particularly exciting truths to be valuable. And even 10 minutes a day, 20 minutes a day of experiencing that bare truth, as boring as it may be, will help us when we go back to the real world and the world of rationality and the world of action. And if we ask ourselves, even after just 10 minutes or 20 minutes of meditation, why? Am I not doing the work that I know I should be doing or that I want to be doing? We'll find a more honest answer. We won't find a perfect answer, but we'll be that much closer to the fully honest answer. And it can be really surprising the extent to which a little meditation can bring us that much closer to uh, our rational conclusions, and that is valuable. I will leave that with you for today. I want to caveat this with um, meditation is not a cure for guilt, right? Um, I, I think it will take many years for a person not to feel any guilt or any anxiety, but to be able to better handle guilt, to better reason our way through a feeling like guilt and to understand what it is, um, is a worthwhile endeavor uh, because these are the sorts of feelings that can um, spiral out of control. They can really kind of build upon themselves and snowball. And if we can find a way to melt the snowball instead of rolling it down a hill, uh, we're that much better off. It may take a long time to melt. I hope everyone is taking care of themselves and taking care of everyone around them. Um, friends of friends, I'm, if you're still watching, uh, it was nice to talk to you. I will talk to you all tomorrow. Enjoy your Saturday. Goodbye.